Good evening, everyone. As people trickle in, I'll say welcome to tonight's program. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I am the curator of programming at Planet Word, a new museum of words and language in downtown Washington, D.C. I think by now many of you have had the chance to come visit us. We are open uh, in person Thursday through Sunday, 10 to 5. If you haven't had a chance yet and you occasionally look at our website and it looks like all of our uh, free passes are already reserved, I encourage you to walk in. Uh, the free passes uh, do get snatched up quite quickly, but because they're free, uh, there's a pretty consistent no-show rate. So we don't actually turn walk-ups away. So come on down whenever you have the urge to come visit Planet Word. Uh, and if you're not here in Washington or uh, you're not quite ready to be in a museum in the current circumstances, uh, we're delighted that you're participating in our virtual offerings like tonight. Um, if you found out about this program through Planet Word because you're already a member, thank you so much for that support. That is enormously important to us. It is how we're able to keep admission free, among other things. Um, if you found out about this program from Dr. Rosenthal or from a friend uh, and you'd like to know more about Planet Word, uh, planetwordmuseum.org is the website. And I think that is it for the business. So uh, with that, I am delighted to introduce our guest, Dr. Norman Rosenthal. He is a psychiatrist and a researcher, has a, a very busy practice here in the DC area. And he's got a new book out that's called Poetry Rx. Um, we have a bookshop.org link to it through um, Planet Word. So that supports both Planet Word and independent bookstores. Uh, and we would love for you to support us in that way as well. So Dr. Rosenthal, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Planet Word. Thank you. It's really fun to be here. Thanks. So with your practice and your research over the years, how is it that you got introduced to poetry? You know, I've always loved poetry. I've always resonated with poetry. And it only began to dawn on me in my increasing experience with, with clients, with patients, that poetry has a great power to heal, inspire, and bring joy to people's lives. I realized that it has done that for me and it's done that for many patients. And one night when I was talking to a friend actually who called me to tell me that he'd lost somebody he really loved and he didn't know how he would ever get, get over it. I thought for a moment and then I said, you know, losing is an art. And like any other art, it can be developed. And he said, have you ever heard of the poem One Art? And I hadn't. Um, and he read it to me, pulled it, pulled it off his bookshelf, read it to me. And as he started reading, I could hear his mood lift and I could feel my mood lifting. It's a wonderful poem and by Elizabeth Bishop. And uh, I thought to myself, wow, you know, here is something that can actually make somebody feel better, whom I just didn't know what to say to. And I'm in the business of whatever it is that can help people feel better. And here is an example. So I then set about looking for other poems, asking my other patients, checking it out. And lo and behold, before I knew it, I had 50 poems. So that became the substance of the book. But I also wanted to show people how you can read a poem to get the most out of it. Because I think for many of us, poet, poetry is like, feels stuffy, out of fashion, boring. We learned it at school. It didn't seem to relate to anything. And what I've tried to do in the book is to show people, no, it's a living, breathing art form. And here's how you can really enjoy it. So that's inspired my present work. Well, let's take that Elizabeth Bishop poem because it's one of my favorites as well. And actually it's in Planet Word. We have a poetry nook in our magical library. Again, those of you who have been there know that one of the bookcases is a door. It's a secret poetry nook. For those of you who have not been there, I will not tell you which bookcase is the door. You'll have to discover it yourselves. But when you find the nook, um, there are wonderful poems read out loud for you. And, and Elizabeth Bishop's One Art is one of them. Um, so tell us, uh, how you read this poem to really get something out of it. Okay, well, just let me just read it straight first before we talk about it, because that way I don't spoil it with my commentary. People can hear it like I heard it that night from my friend. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. 
lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses when the art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied, it's evident. The art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it like disaster. So the poem is uh, written in a form that's very, very difficult. It's called a villanelle, which uh, speaks to the musical quality of the poem. It has a, an a alternating rhyme scheme, uh, a certain uh, rhythm to it, and uh, lines that keep repeating, each time coming back in a different context. The lines here are the art of losing, isn't hard to master, their loss is no disaster. And as she deepens into the poem, the losses get bigger and bigger until we really realize that she's been reading this to a lost love and that that's been the theme to which she's been building up. And that even though she says it's no disaster, it's clear that it's not an easy thing to do either. So it's an honest acknowledgement that loss on the one hand is possible. It's not too hard to master, but it can really seem like a disaster. So that's the first poem in the collection. And I, I still love it. Every time I read it, I discover something new in it. And I marvel at the genius of Elizabeth Bishop, who was a master at loss. She lost her mother at a young age, her father at a young age, and um, went from foster place to foster place and knew more than her share of loss. And she, you feel it in the poem here. You do. And I think, um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the complexity of the form. Um, I think it is a tribute to her genius that you feel the emotion behind it instead of paying too much attention to the rhyme scheme or the um, the rhythm. Um, but when you do start looking at the rhymes and near rhymes, words like fluster and gesture uh, that are not an exact rhyme for disaster or faster or master, it's, um, it's really clever in its wordplay in addition to profound in its meaning. I agree. Do you encourage people to read poetry uh, in therapy? Do you encourage them to read it out loud? I do, because when you read something loud, you experience it differently. You, you hear your own voice. You kind of own it in a way that when it's on the page, it's there. But when you read it, it's here. And the perspective really influences things. And also, poetry is like a kind of music. Imagine just reading the score of a song versus actually singing it or hearing it sung. I encourage people to listen to beautiful renditions of poems, often by the, uh, often by the uh, author herself or himself. There's a wonderful reading of um, a sonnet by Edna St. Vincent Millay that's, that's in the collection. Um, Pity me not because the light of day is the sonnet and she reads it and it's just haunting to hear her voice as she reads it aloud. Do you find that people are self-conscious about poetry because it is um, a form that requires some formality, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, that reading it out loud feels performative in a way that reading prose doesn't? Well, I think it's changing because a rap is a kind of poetry. Sure. And rap is the poetry with slant rhymes. 
and um, the, the meter isn't always predictable. And so that's a kind of poetry that's very popular these days. Look at Amanda Gorman at the inauguration. Mm -hmm. She was dynamite. She really stole the show in some ways. And that was with a poem that she'd written that she was performing. So I think that poetry is actually enjoying a resurgence. And it's, it's the oldest form of literature. they are poems going back thousands of years. So I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. I think we're just rediscovering it. Do you think that as a form, it has a unique therapeutic quality different from prose? I do, because, you know, if you read a novel, and I know we've talked and you love reading novels, um, if you read a novel, you have to do a lot of reading in order to get a payoff. Um, you know, characters develop over hundreds of pages. You've got to remember what happened in the first chapter in order to really appreciate what happens in the 25th chapter. And the poem is right there. And I've chosen poems that are really readily digestible, you know, not the rhyme of the ancient mariner or God forbid, <laughs> paradise lost. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them fit on one page. And, and so to encapsulate, you know, profound ideas and see them develop as we did in one art and as we do in many others over such a short span, I, I come, these are poems, many of them, all of them really, that I've come back to again and again. And in almost every one, I give stories of people whose lives have been changed by the poem. Uh, one story of uh, uh, the poem, uh, We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. The person who brought that to my attention said it one of, was one of the poems that helped save his life hmm. because it, it speaks to the rapid progression from skipping school and landing up dead. And so poems can serve so many different purposes. And as you say, they're portable. Yes. Um, I should encourage folks, by the way, and some of you did this uh, before tonight's program. Uh, if you have poems that you turn to in, for solace or inspiration or comfort, um, we'd love to see your suggestions. Um, we are always gathering, I think, among us uh, more, more ideas for good poetry. Um, the book is sort of organized by um, therapeutic need almost, sort of what each purpose these poems can serve. Um, describe for me a little bit about why you chose to organize it that way um, and what poem sort of goes with what need. Well, I looked at all the poems and they fell into five categories. The first is loving and losing. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Tennyson's great quote. And, um, you know, love, the loss of love is so painful that poets have turned to it as a way of consolation. And the experience of love is so intense and passionate that poets have turned to it to just celebrate their feelings. So it's a great beginning. Then I was really surprised at poems that are responses to nature. And what really fascinated me is it wasn't simply, oh gosh, look at the gorgeous waterfall, or isn't that tree amazing or whatever. You know, it wasn't banal, even though those are really valid experiences and expressions. They're different. I think of Thomas Hardy's Darkling Thrush. He's standing there at the end of the 19th century. He's feeling gloom. It's dark. The landscape is dark. Maybe he's got seasonal affective disorder. In any event, he's really gloom and doom and looking out at the next century with foreboding. And then a little bird, uh, an aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small in blast beruffled plume, sings out this amazing note of, of music. And he thinks, wow, you know, that's just amazing because maybe, maybe he knows something that I don't know. 
Hmm. Maybe there's something out there that really is a voice of hope. So that's a simple example of somebody who, in an ordinary landscape, manages to pull out this voice of hope. And as I point out in the book, anybody else might have said, you know, I was leaning against a gate. I was feeling rather gloomy. Then this birdie chirped away. And I thought, how about going inside and getting a cup of tea? Things aren't so bad, you know? And, and yet here we are 150 years later reading this masterpiece. And it, it's really wonderful. And there are many others. There's, for example, Gerard Manley Hopkins talking about um, pied beauty. He's celebrating the beauty of things that are different, maybe different colors, fish or cows that are different shades, different colors, and things that are, as he puts it, fickle, freckled, counter, original, spare, who knows how. So he is really celebrating diversity in the late 19th century. He's saying all of these unusual, different things have an important role to play in our world. And what an advanced concept that was at that time, and so on and so forth. So the second part is nature and what people had to say and derive from their experiences. Then I've got a miscellaneous category. It's a lot of different wonderful things. The, the danger of anger, the, the importance of reconciliation, the importance of hope, etc. And then one which is uh, the purpose of living and the search for meaning. And the last one, which is called into the night, which is aging and think, thoughts of death. So tries to cover the whole landscape of the human life. Um, I should say in an aside, um, for you to retroactively diagnose someone with seasonal affective disorder is not quite as odd as it sounds since you in fact coined that term and um, identified that disorder. So um, you have some authority there. Let's put up uh, outside of uh, ideas of wrongdoing and right doing because let me read it and then I'll explain to people how I use this in my actual therapy. Out Beyond Ideas by Jalaluddin Rumi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Now, I, I like that poem a lot because oftentimes when I'm dealing with couples, they are squabbling, they are in discord. And she says, he does this and, and he shouldn't. And that's where the trouble comes from. And he says, well, she doesn't do that. And that's why I do this. And they turn to me like to a judge in a courtroom I must render the verdict and issue the sentence. And I tell them, you know, I'm not a judge. I'm here to see if I can help you come together. I always think of angry squabbling couples. Something may have, must have brought them together in the first place. They were pulled together. They were attracted to each other. Is it possible to recapture some of that old magic? And they, they continue to squabble. And then I said, let me read you a poem. And they look at me, you know, like, what's this all about? And something about startling them and shaking them out of their fixed to and fro ha actually has some benefit all by itself. And then I read it to them. You know, um, let's get beyond wrongfulness and rightfulness. Let's get beyond who's right and who's wrong and let's move towards reconciliation. There is a field, the poet says, there's something out there that's beautiful. I'll meet you there. So he or she makes the first move, extends an arm, I'll meet you there. And somebody has got to make a first move in fixing things, in, in formal speak with uh, family therapy, it's called a repair attempt. Somebody tries to repair things and how that repair attempt is accepted 
can be very important in determining how the relationship ends. If the other one says, yeah, okay, I'll meet you there. That's one thing. But if the other one says, no way am I gonna meet you in the field? Well, <laughs> they lose an opportunity because somebody is extending themselves. If somebody extends themselves and the other one smacks the hand down, that's very discouraging. So the, the comments that when the soul lies down in that long grass, the world is too full to talk about. You know, when we're lying down, you know, when you're lying down, you're looking up at the sky, the clouds are floating overhead, it's hard to really get into squabbling because everything is too beautiful. And mundane things like thoughts, ideas, even the phrase each other doesn't seem to mean anything anymore. So that is Rumi, a 13th century Persian poet uh, who we're now, what, seven, 800 years later, still celebrating his wisdom. Uh, and he, in fact, was a great spiritual leader and his spiritual uh, home, his ancestral home, is uh, now a shrine for people who are so influenced and moved by his amazing poetry. So I think that the squabbling couples is an interesting example, right? Because I can see where there might be moments in a therapeutic environment where someone says, stop making me read poetry. That's not what I need right now. Have you sort of a, adapted the way you use this as a tool um, or thought differently about it? The more, are, are you finding you're using it more or less? Um, you know, about the same, you know, when I was thinking of the book, obviously it was top of mind. And now there are so many other things, but I wouldn't hesitate. There are certain cues that, like, like if somebody said, you know, stop reading poetry, uh, it's not helping. I might say, well, what do you think would help? Mm -hmm. And I would turn it around and use it as an opportunity to challenge people to try and find the answers for themselves, because obviously that's what we all have to do. We have to find the answers and I can only gently guide them or provoke them or interest them. I'll use whatever technique I need or can to get people to talk to each other mm -hmm. in a good way. Um, I'd like to sort of turn to the idea of uh, poetry as uh, consolation in times of grief. I think that that is a um, role that we can all pretty easily see poetry playing a role in. Um, but I also think that we've all had a year and a half, right, where I think we all are looking for a little comfort. Um, what poems do you choose in that context? Well, um... You know, I've thought of this quite a lot. And actually, I like Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death. I think it's a very great poem. And you know a poem is great when you keep coming back to it. And um, I haven't actually ever read it in a presentation before. But since you asked the question in that way, uh, Actually, <clears throat> let, me, let me change my mind. The most consoling poem with regard to grief is the last poem, way and above. It is, it is recited at funerals probably more than any other poem. Emily Dickinson's is a great poem and I, I recommend it to you. This one that I'm about to read is poem 50. Emily Dickinson's is poem 49. Please read it because it's, it's, it's just moved me so much. But here, here is, do not stand at my grave and weep. By Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the star sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of 
quiet birds in circled flight. I'm the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I'm not there. I did not die. Uh, and that poem, probably more than any other, is a consolation because we all want to feel, and in fact, some element of our loved ones lives on, even if it's just in our minds, maybe in other ways as well. I don't know, we don't know. Um, but it really consoles people a lot. And the backstory is very, very interesting. When it was published in a book by the BBC of the favorite poems in Britain, the results of a survey, um, it was the write-in favorite. It wasn't listed as one of the poems they could choose, but by the time the contest was over, there were 30,000 requests for this mm. particular poem. And uh, they listed it as anonymous. But then the help columnist, Dear Abby, tracked it down and found out that a Baltimore housewife had written it. And what had happened was that she and her husband were housing a young woman from Germany who had fled the Nazi threat in Germany and was now living with them. And she had heard that her mother was dying and she was grieving the fact not only that her mother was dying, but that she was robbed of the opportunity to stand at her grave and weep. And the Baltimore housewife, Mary Elizabeth Fry, on a brown paper bag from shopping, quickly wrote out this poem. And there's no history of her having been a poet before or since. The only thing we really know about that she's written, but it's made such a huge impact that I had to include it. That's an amazing story. We've gotten a bunch of great suggestions, particularly for poems about grief in the chat as well. Epitaph by Merritt Malloy, Funeral Blues by W.H. Auden, which is a great poem. Um, and some people have been posting uh, poems that are a little more hopeful, uh, not necessarily directly about dealing with death, but sort of how to get through another day. Um, so uh, there's one, uh, Charmaine has posted, um, it, it's, she posted it word for word in the chat. I encourage people to read it. I had not read it before she emailed it to me the other day. Um, and it's a really lovely poem. Um, you know, we did a poetry program here for Planet Word on um, January 7th. And, you know, January 6th here in Washington was fairly traumatic. And I, um, to be frank, had underestimated how much our audience wanted to talk about poetry in the wake of January 6th. I had thought that um, we'd have a lot of drop off in interest because people would be so distracted. Um, and uh, it, you know, I, I shouldn't, I, sh I should have known, right? I should have realized that people really do in times of chaos, in times of confusion, in times where you feel like you're losing control, turn to these comforting inspirational forms. If, if I may, I would like to read Funeral Blues. It's in the book as one of the, the loss of a loved one. And it, it, it's a fantastic poem. And it illustrates such an important point that I'll share with you once I've read it. It's not very long. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the pianos and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle, moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crepe bows round the white necks of the public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east, my west, my working week, and my Sunday rest. My noon, my midnight, my talk, my song, I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can ever come to any good. 
this was made very famous um, in the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral, where um, a man reads it at the funeral um, of his deceased partner. And um, there wasn't a dry eye amongst the funeral guests, and I reckon there were pretty much plenty of wet eyes in the, in the movie house uh, as well. And um, it then became uh, a collection uh, of Auden's poems, 10 love poems that sold hundreds of thousands of copies, which is very rare for poetry. Um, the interesting thing, and, and then 9-11 happened, and people scribbled excerpts from the poem on the broken, shattered walls of the Twin Towers. Um, the interesting thing is, it speaks of such unmitigated grief. Nothing now can ever come to any good. So you can ask yourself, how can a poem like that, that's so profoundly grief-stricken, be actually helpful to people? But it's well known that people who are grieving, they don't want to hear jolly uh, upper poems. It's not going to help them. They want to know that others are suffering too and that others have suffered and somehow they've survived. It's validating to their feelings. So that's why this is such a wonderful poem, uh, as I'm sure are many of the others that your readers have suggested. Right, I mean, I, I don't think everybody needs to hear, you know, buck up buttercup when they're in the midst of grief. Sometimes hearing it's awful and it's gonna be awful for a little while is what you need to hear. Um, I know that we have some questions coming in from the audience. And again, uh, I encourage you to put the, all of those in the Q&A box. Uh, there was a question asking if you ever encourage people to write their own poetry. I think that it's very helpful for people to write poetry, but not everybody has that gift or has that inclination. So that hasn't been my focus. My focus has rather been these gems that are accessible to all of us. And if people write poetry, which is really a separate discipline, and it's been shown that writing your thoughts and feelings in general is very, very valuable. There's a uh, professor of uh, psychology at the University of Texas in Austin named James Pennybaker, who has innovated uh, what he calls the writing exercise where you write about your deepest thoughts and feelings. You do it like four times over a 10 day period, 20 minutes each time. And uh, just that small amount of writing has carry out effects on the psychological and physical well-being uh, for weeks or months afterwards. So yes, I encourage people to write. I don't um, like to put pressure on them that they have to deliver something of particular quality because that defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had James Pennebaker here on a program and he took us through a couple of writing exercises. He's a wonderful person. Um, he's on our advisory board at Planet Work. Um, and somebody asked, what's the difference for you and in the clinical setting um, for patients, for poetry as therapy as different from reading for therapy by a non-poet author? I think I'm asking that correctly. So um, how, I guess, how is it different therapeutically for poetry as opposed to other kinds of reading? Well, you know, I, I come from a research tradition and I like to do something that's very specific. So for example, when we did our light therapy studies, we had X amount of light at a certain distance for certain kinds of people. And we found that light did in fact help people who got depressed in the winter and for that matter, at other times of year as well. Um, likewise, um, with a colleague, I, uh, I, we, we did Botox treatment for depression because the theory was that the frown is causing the depression. It's not only reflecting the depression. And in fact, in a controlled study, we found that to be 
the case that Botox did in fact have antidepressant effects when injected between the eyebrows. Um, now, we've done no controlled studies with poetry itself, but it, to me, it represents, you know, here are 50 examples of things that you can read rather easily that fall into categories so that you can say, I'm grieving, let me look at that section. I'm madly in love, but does she love me back? Or I was in love and now she's written me a dear John letter and I can't get over it. Maybe I can, let me look in the book. So uh, I think that I've customized the poems to specific human states of mind. If you're gonna read a long and complicated novel, remembrance of things past or, you know, uh, more, more modern equivalents, long complicated uh, novels, they could help you, no doubt. But um, it's not going to be so simple because a, a modern novel or any novel is going to have many themes, many strains, issues of people coming and going. And oftentimes, a novel doesn't make a point. It, it, pre it presents different points of view in a complicated and intertwined way. Uh, so I think that to, to say read Anna Karenin, um, I can't really, I can mean, I can imagine it being a great read or uh, The Lord of the Rings or anything really, but it doesn't in my mind lend itself so simply. I like to keep it simple because even simple things are hard for people to do, let alone complicated things. Uh, what poem do you recommend in the, oh my gosh, I'm in love and I'm not sure he loves me back? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, let's look at Shakespeare and look at um, his sonnets. Um, you know, um, okay. Here's a wonderful poem because it goes all the way back to a contemporary of Shakespeare called Sir John Suckling. And it's why so pale and fond, and why so pale and one fond lover? Pretty why so pale? Will, when looking well, can't move her, looking ill, prevail? Pretty, why so pale? Why so dull and mute, young sinner? Prithee, why so mute? Will, when speaking well, can't win her, saying nothing, do it? Prithee, why so mute? Quit, quit for shame. This will not move. This cannot take her. If of herself she will not love, nothing can make her. The devil take her. So here's an older man counseling this younger man who's lovesick for someone who clearly isn't into him. And uh, I make the segue in my discussion of a book which got a lot of play in the past few decades called He's Just Not That Into You. <laughs> so in this case, it was directed to a woman who thought that she was in love with a guy or maybe she is in love with a guy and he seemed to be interested in her and now he doesn't return her calls. And when he does, he says, well, my mother is sick and I had to be sitting by her bedside. And the guy makes the point that no son sits, or very few sons sit by the mother's bedside 24 seven. If he's giving you these excuses, you know, instead of trying to figure out what's going on in his mind, which is kind of useless, just accept he's not that into you and move on. So the modern man talking to in this book, talking to, say, a modern woman, but it could just as easily be a man, has come to the same point. If of herself she will not, how does it go? If of herself she will not love, nothing can make her. You know, I, I think of the last act of the famous opera Carmen, when the uh, captain of the guard is mad about Carmen and she's not re, she's not responding and she's not requiting his love. And he comes to her in that last scene and he says, you know, 
why don't you show me some love? And, and you know, she's kind of mystified. She says, you know, you've lost it already. So how are you going to recapture it? But he's mad in passion. And so it has a tragic ending. But um, that's just a poem from hundreds of years ago, not thousands, feels like it, but Shakespeare's time, 400, half a thousand years ago. And it still has relevance. You know, um, quit, quit for shame. It's enough, you know, move on. So it's tough love. But sometimes tough love is good love. I don't know. You would you judge for yourself? <laughs> no, it made me laugh. I I didn't know the poem, but um, I can absolutely see that in certain circumstances it's handy. Um, you said at the beginning of our program that in some ways you um, teach people to read poetry. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, read it just plain. That's why it's the first thing that will appear in every chapter. I don't want, I want people to come to it with a fresh mind. Then read it aloud, note the sounds, the rhymes, the little things that give you pleasure. Listen to other people reading it, oftentimes the poets themselves. In Germany at the Max Planck Institute in Munich, they wired people up. They wired up their brains and they even wired up their skin. And what they saw was that at certain times in the poem, they would get goosebumps or chills. And those were times when there was activity in the reward center in the brain. So these goosebumps and chills seem to be mediated by the reward center of the brain, which is processing the sounds, the rhythms, the meanings of these words. And often they would find that the payoff, the chills or goosebumps would come at the end of the lines. Um, there's a poem by W.B. Yeats called An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. And he, he writes, I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I God, I do not love. Okay, so we've got meet my fate, uh, above, hate, love, very much emotional words coming at the end of the line. And that's what they often found. And each stanza delivers its bolt at the end of the line. So there's a lot of mechanics involved in bringing about the effects of these great poems, but you don't have to worry about them. Just enjoy them and experience them, including their healing potential. One of the uh, poems you had talked about ahead of time that I'd love for you to read and tell me what um, context you find it helpful in is in Invictus. Yes, oh, this is a great poem by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Um, what makes this so wonderful is that many times people find themselves all alone with no resources at hand to back them, to help them, to support them. And this poem says, when everybody has deserted you, when there's nothing there left, You've always got yourself, your unconquerable soul. And interestingly, the great Nelson Mandela from my country, South Africa, um, was imprisoned for 18 years uh, on a fortress prison outside of Cape Town in the sea, an island. Um, and he was there for 18 years and he engraved this poem on the side of his cell, on his cell wall and taught it to other inmates as well. And it was a great 
source of comfort and consolation. There was even a movie made called Invictus, all about Nelson Mandela. And when he died, uh, President Obama went to South Africa to be at his graveside, uh, mourn his death. And he actually read this last stanza from this poem. Now, at the end of each poem, I give a little bio sketch of each poet and I match up the poet with a poem. And in this particular case, William Ernest Henley had suffered from TB of the bones, tuberculosis of the bones, which is very painful. And it required him to have a below knee amputation on one side, and they were now saying, you're gonna to have to have it on the other side. He said, nothing doing. He went up to Edinburgh to consult with Joseph Lister, a great experimental surgeon and saved that leg. In Edinburgh, he met Robert Louis Stevenson with whom he became friends and who modeled his famous Long John Silver on William Ernest Henley the one-legged man or the, the man who had a stump for a leg. And um, he was a very inspirational person. So that's one poem that I feel often is very helpful to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, uh, that's the sort of overarching goal of almost any issue that you're facing. If you find the strength within yourself, uh, it's kind of the ultimate skill you need to handle almost anything, right? Exactly. Now, I love to pair that poem with another poem. Yeah. Can I read another one? <laughs> yes, please. Because what I know as a psychiatrist and all of us knows is sometimes the challenge isn't coming from the outside. It's coming from the inside. Um, maybe we wake up depressed. Maybe we wake up with the after effects of medicine that we took the night before, or we just we don't feel like facing the day. And here is um, Theodore Rutke, who actually won the Pulitzer Prize uh, in his famous poem, The Waking. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear. I learn by going where I have to go. We think by feeling, what is there to know? I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Of those so close beside me, which are you? God bless the ground, I shall walk softly there and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lonely worm climbs up a winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me. So take the lively air and lovely, learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady. I should know what falls away is always and is near. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. So here is a man who understands that other people may wake and jump out of bed and be full of vitality, but he wakes into a state that feels like sleep. And what can he do? He takes his waking slow. He has learned, don't rush yourself, don't push yourself, you'll trip, you'll fall, you'll just make yourself more depressed. Take it slow, little bit by little bit, just the way the lowly worm climbs up the winding stair, just the way creatures in nature do what they need to do to get from here to there. I learn by going where I have to go. Sometimes it's easier to change your thinking by changing your acting, rather than changing your acting by changing your thinking. I learn by going where I have to go. And, uh, you know, in, in the 12 step programs, for example, they often say insight follows action. First you act and then you know where you're supposed to go. For those astute people in the audience, you may realize the art form. It's a villanelle, our old friend from one art. Rhyming, alternating rhyme scheme, two 
sentences that keep repeating, 19 lines, blah, blah, blah. But the ultimate effect is this magical, circular, musical quality that the villanelle has. Mm -hmm. I love that I learn by going where I have to go as well. It's it's such a recipe for getting out of your own head, right? Um, and and um, not over preparing and and not planning everything in advance. You're you're gonna learn along the way, so you might as well get going where you have to go. Um, we are out of time. It has been a delight to spend an hour with you. I told you it would go fast. Um, the book again is called Poetry Rx. Uh, I recommend everybody take a look at it. It really has 50, in, 50 poems um, to inspire and comfort and turn to in times of joy, in times of sorrow, in times of trauma. So um, it has been uh, a pleasure to read and a pleasure to get to talk to you about it. Norman Rosenthal, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a real joy. And thank you all everyone for being here and for your ongoing support of Planet Word. We hope to see you at the museum soon. Good night.